Hi folks. Hi. I hope you're doing well. I'm doing readings today because I like to read. It makes me feel good inside. I'm not sure where exactly. And I want to read to you today so that if you're feeling down, you'll feel more uppity. And if you're already up, you'll feel even more bitter. So what's not to like? This is just a random page. Now I've got several books here. And I wish I could read them all, but gosh darn it, I don't have the time, or it's not even possible, because I don't want to make like a five hour video, because ain't nobody got time for that. So without further ado, check this out. I bet you can guess already which author it's from. I love so many authors, but I love the most the authors which talk about polarities. Polarities and thinking and reality and just like what are the extremes and what's all the spectrum in between. I love that. Carl Jung was one of those. Krishnamurti was one of those. Just, and Watts, obviously one of my favorites. Love the Watts. Can't get enough of it. So here we go. <clears throat> um, ah, so things are separable in words which are inseparable in nature because words are counters and classifiers which can be arranged in any order. The word being is formally separate from the word nothing as pleasure from pain. But in nature, being and nothing or solid in space constitute a relationship as inseparable as back and front. In the same way, the formally static character of our words for feelings conceals the fact or better the event that our feelings are directions rather than states and that in the realm of direction there is no north without south in the great asian traditions however spirit as brahman or Tao is less easily confused with the abstract spirit is found in the direct experience of the concrete natural world in what buddhists would call its suchness or tatata in some degree. Da, da, da. That is, in its non-verbal and non-conceptual state. That is not, however, what we mean by the world in its material or physical state, for, as we shall see, the word material stands for the word as meter or measure. The non-verbal world represented in terms of distinct facts, things, and events, events which, like feet and inches, are human inventions for handling and describing the world. There is no word for what the world is in its natural, non-verbal state. For the question, what is it, what is it, is really asking, in what class is it? Now it should be obvious that classification is again a human intervention, human invention, I and that the natural world is not given to us in a classified form, in cans with labels. When we ask what anything is in its natural state, the only answer can be to point to it directly, suggesting that the questioner observe it with a silent mind. Silent observation of this kind is exactly what is meant here by feeling, as distinct from particular feelings. The attitude and approach whereby nature must be explored if we are to recover our original sense of integrity with the natural world, in Taoism and Zen, this attitude is called Quan, or worldless contempl contemplation, worldless contemplation. Just as one must sometimes be silent in order to hear what others have to say, so thought itself must be silent if it is to think about anything other than itself. We need hardly be surprised if, in default of this silence, our minds begin to be haunted by words about words about words. It is a short step from this to the fantasy that the word is prior to nature itself, when, in fact, it is only prior to the classification of nature, to the sorting of nature into things and events, for it is things, not the natural world itself, which are created by the word. word not by the word of the word. But for lack of a mental silence, the two are confused. Now, 
The spell of words is by no means an enchantment to which only the intellectual is disposed. The most simple-minded people are easily, as easily its prey, and it would seem that, at all levels of society, the cultures in which Christianity has arisen has been peculiarly confused by the powerful instrument of language, especially the English language this year. It has run away with them like a new gadget with a child, so that excessive verbal communication is really the characteristic disease of the West. We're simply unable to stop it, for when we are not talking to others, we're compulsively thinking, that is, talking subvocally to ourselves. Communication has become a nervous habit, and cultures strike us as mysterious as ba and baffling which do not at once tell all, or, worse, expect us to understand their certain things without being told. I shall never forget the Japanese artist Hasegawa yelling in exasperation at the endless request for explanations from his Western students, What is the matter with you? Can't you feel? For one type of culture, then, the truth about nature is the verbal explanation or reconstruction of the world. Considered as a system of law which precedes and underlies it as the plan in the mind of the architect comes before the building of a house. But for another type it is nature itself experienced directly in mental silence, which in Zen Buddhism is called Wu Nin, or no thought. Thus, in the cultures of the Far East, we rarely find the discrepancy between religion and nature so characteristic of the West. On the contrary, the finest Buddhist and Taoist art of China and Japan is not, as one might suppose, concerned with formerly religious themes, but landscape painting and studies of birds, trees, rocks, and plants. Furthermore, Zen is applied directly to the technique of gardening and to a style of architecture which deliberately integrates the house with its natural surroundings, which simultaneously encloses man and admits nature. These, rather than Buddha images, express the knowledge of ultimate reality. And just like this, that sound is ultimate reality. <laughs> It is. And here we might mention a curious and apparently trivial symptom of the rift not only between Christianity and nature, but also between Christianity and the naturalistic art forms of the Far East. Strangely enough, it is almost impossible to represent the central symbol of Christianity, the cross or crucifixion, in the Chinese style of painting. It has been tried many times, but never succeeds, for the symmetrical form of the cross completely destroys the rhythm of a Chinese painting, if it is made the principal, Im if it is made, uh, the principal image of the picture. Chinese Christians have tried to solve the problem by painting rustic crosses with bark, twigs, and moss still on the wood, but those two straight beams simply draw with the rest of the painting, and without destroying the symbol of the cross, the artist cannot follow his natural tendency to bend the straight lines irregularly, for he follows nature in loving forms that are flowing, jagged and unsymmetrical, forms eminently suited to his media, the soft brush and blank bra black ink. <laughs> but in the art forms of Christianity, such as Byzantine and Gothic, we find a love for the architectural and the courtly, God is conceived in the image of a throne monarch, and the rituals of the church are patterned after the court ceremonials of the Greco-Roman emperors. Likewise, in the ancient Hebrew religion, the Ark of the Covenant was essentially a throne, hidden in the inner sanctuary of the Holy of Holies, which was built in the form of a perfect cube, symbol of completeness and perfection. Yet, from the standpoint of Chinese philosophy and aesthetics, this symmetrical and architectonic perfection is rigid and lifeless. Such forms are found but rarely in nature, and thus when the Chinese artist starts to paint the rigid cross, he finds himself in conflict, for what he really wants to paint is a living fucking tree. Sorry, there's no fucking in there, not sorry. Furthermore, he thinks of the power behind nature, not in the image of a monarch, but as the Tao. The way, course, or flow of nature, and finds images for it in water and wind, in the air and sky, as well as in the process seas of growth. There was no sense that the Tao had any inclination to obtrude itself or to shine in glory like a monarch, but rather to work hidden and unknown, making it appear that all its achievements were the work of others in the words of Lao Tzu, 
The great Tao flows everywhere to the left and to the right. All things depend upon it to exist and it does not abandon them to its accomplishment. It lays no claims. It loves and nourishes all things but does not lord it over them. A fucking man.